fixed function, programmable shaders, and unified shaders. Early graphics hardware used a fixed function pipeline. The stages were predetermined in silicon, transform and lighting, triangle setup, texturing, rasterization, and blending. Developers could only toggle settings and feed parameters. The hardware applied the same limited sequence to every vertex and every pixel. You could not insert your own math for lighting models, skinning, or post-processing. This made the pipeline fast for its narrow set of tasks, but inflexible. Any effect outside those built-in steps required awkward workarounds rounds, extra passes, or was simply not possible. The next step was the programmable shader pipeline. Hardware vendors added tiny programs that run on the card itself. A vertex shader program runs once per vertex to transform positions, bend or skin characters, compute per vertex lighting, and pass custom values to later stages. A pixel fragment shader program runs for each covered pixel to compute its final color using your own lighting equation, texture sampling plan, or post-processing effect. These programs are written in high-level shading languages and compiled to run on the card. The result is huge flexibility. Normal mapping, parallax mapping, soft particles, tone mapping, bloom, and many other effects became practical because developers could express the math directly on the hardware. Modern designs then moved to a unified shader architecture. Instead of separate blocks dedicated to vertex programs, and pixel programs, the card provides one large pool of identical arithmetic units that can run any shader stage, vertex, geometry, pixel, compute, and more. A hardware scheduler distributes work to this shared pool, so the card can keep its units busy, whether a scene is heavy on pixel shading, heavy on vertex work, or mixed. This improves efficiency, simplifies load balancing, and makes room for general compute workloads, such as physics, simulation, image processing, and machine learning kernels. Unified designs are now the baseline across desktop, mobile, and integrated graphics because they let the hardware adapt to whatever mix of shader tasks a frame demands. Immediate mode rendering and tile-based deferred rendering. Immediate mode rendering is the traditional approach used by most desktop graphics cards. The GPU takes each triangle, transforms it, rasterizes it into pixels, runs pixel shaders, applies blending, and writes the result to the frame buffer in memory, immediately as each piece is processed. This is straightforward, but it means that the card often writes a lot of data out to memory and then reads it back again for later blending, depth testing, or post-processing. Because external memory access is expensive in both time and power, Power, this approach requires very high memory bandwidth, which is why desktop graphics cards are paired with wide GDDR or HBM memory buses. Tile-based deferred rendering works differently. Instead of sending every pixel directly to the frame buffer right away, the GPU first breaks the screen into small tiles. Each tile holds a portion of the geometry and pixel data. The GPU sorts which primitives affect each tile, then runs shading for all of the pixels in that tile at once, using fast on-chip memory buffers instead of writing every intermediate step out to external memory. Only the finished tile is written back to the frame buffer. This approach saves bandwidth and reduces power usage because external memory is accessed much less often. It is especially well suited to mobile and integrated GPUs, where power efficiency is critical. The trade-off is complexity. A tile-based design needs to store and sort geometry before shading, which adds overhead for very complex scenes with many overlapping objects. Immediate mode rendering, while less efficient in bandwidth, is simpler and more predictable for large-scale PC and console games with massive geometry. Because of this, desktop GPUs from NVIDIA and AMD traditionally use immediate mode, while mobile GPUs from ARM, Imagination, and Apple rely heavily on tile-based deferred rendering. NVIDIA Tesla Architecture NVIDIA's G80 introduced the company's first unified shader design for consumer graphics, launching with the GeForce 8800 series on November 8, 2006, and adding full DirectX 10 and Shader Model 4.0 support. Unified shaders meant one pool of arithmetic units could run any stage, vertex, pixel, or geometry, so the scheduler could keep the chip busy regardless of workload mix. This was a major step beyond the older split pipelines. Inside the chip, the Tesla design arranged 128 scalar cores into 16 streaming multiprocessors, grouped into eight texture processor clusters. This layout scaled well and fed the unified shader model efficiently for both graphics and general computation. G 
also arrived alongside CUDA, NVIDIA's general purpose programming model, turning the graphics processor into a parallel compute device for simulation and scientific tasks, planting the seeds for modern GPU computing across GeForce, Quadro, and data center products. NVIDIA Fermi and Kepler. Fermi, 2010, Fermi brought full Direct X11 features and a much wider, more general-purpose design. Each streaming multiprocessor added larger caches, more load store units, and many more arithmetic lanes, so complex shaders and compute kernels ran faster. Geometry stages were strengthened to push more tessellation, and raster and blending blocks were expanded for higher fill rate. Fermi also improved context switching and error protection to make general computing on the graphics card more reliable. These changes made the graphics card better at both games and parallel computing. Kepler, 2012. Kepler focused on efficiency per watt and higher throughput. The new SMX multiprocessor grouped more arithmetic units under a simpler scheduler, raising delivered performance while lowering power versus Fermi at the same manufacturing process. For computing, Kepler introduced dynamic parallelism. Kernels can launch new kernels on the device and HyperQ, which lets many CPU threads feed the same graphics card to keep it busy. In games, this translated into more performance per square millimeter and cooler, quieter boards. NVIDIA Maxwell and Pascal. Maxwell, 2014 to 2015, Maxwell redesigned the streaming multiprocessor into the SMM unit to deliver much higher efficiency per watt than Kepler. The changes included leaner control logic, finer-grained clock gating, improved instruction scheduling, and better load balancing. So more of the silicon's math units stayed busy while using less power. Maxwell also expanded the L2 cache and improved memory compression, which cut external memory traffic and raised effective bandwidth, critical for gaming performance without wider memory buses. Cards like GeForce GTX 980 and 970 showcased these gains. For compute, Maxwell continued full CUDA support while prioritizing gaming efficiency. Pascal, 2016 to 2017, Pascal moved to 16 nanometer Fin FE manufacturing and pushed both graphics and compute forward. The data center Tesla P100 combined HBM2 memory, NV-Link high bandwidth interconnect, and unified memory with page migration, making very large data sets easier to program and faster to move between the central processor and the graphics processor. On gaming cards like GeForce GTX 1080, Pascal paired GDDR5X, with new graphics features such as simultaneous multi-projection for efficient multi-display and virtual reality rendering, plus finer preemption so long compute or graphics tasks could be interrupted more gracefully. Overall, Pascal delivered higher performance, much better performance per watt, and a major uplift in memory bandwidth versus Maxwell. NVIDIA Turing, Ampere, Ada, and Blackwell. Turing, 2018, introduced two new fixed units alongside the programmable shaders, ray tracing cores that accelerate bounding volume hierarchy traversal and triangle ray tests, and tensor cores that accelerate matrix math for artificial intelligence. This enabled hybrid rendering, rasterization for primary visibility, plus hardware accelerated ray tracing for reflections, global illumination, and shadows, denoised by artificial intelligence filters. Turing also added advanced shading features such as mesh and task shading in the professional stack, variable rate shading, and a modern cache hierarchy to feed the cores efficiently. Ampere, 2020, increased throughput per watt and advanced the artificial intelligence path. Third-generation Tensor Cores added new math formats such as TensorFlow 32 and BrainFloat 16, giving speedups for training and inference without code changes. Graphics chips like GA102, used in the GeForce RTX 3880 family, paired wider data paths with faster memory and better compression, raising effective bandwidth for ray-traced and rasterized scenes. The result was higher frame rates at the same power and faster artificial intelligence denoising and super-resolution. Ada Lovelace, 2022. Ada redesigned the front end and scheduling for ray traced workloads. Shader execution reordering dynamically groups similar rays so the hardware runs more coherent code paths, significantly boosting ray tracing performance in complex scenes. Fourth generation tensor cores, plus a new optical flow accelerator, enabled deep learning super sampling three frame generation, which synthesizes intermediate frames to increase perceived frame rate. Ada also expanded ray tracing core capability and 
improved the memory subsystem to keep the arithmetic units busy. Blackwell 2024 to 2025 is a next-generation architecture that scales further for artificial intelligence and graphics. In the data center family, Blackwell packages two large dies into a single logical graphics processor, linked by a 10 terabytes per second on-package interconnect, and raises transistor counts dramatically on a custom 4 nanometer process. On the consumer side, GeForce RTX 50 series cards bring Blackwell features to games, including the next wave of ray tracing and artificial intelligence acceleration and deep learning super sampling 4 with multi-frame generation. Professional RTX Pro Blackwell cards add very large frame buffers, next generation G, DDR7 memory interfaces, and updated ray tracing and tensor engines for creation and simulation. ATI and AMD Terascale. Terascale was ATI's and later AMD's last major architecture before Graphics Core Next. It used very long instruction word style shader cores. In very long instruction word, each instruction packs several independent operations that must all be executed in the same cycle. Early Terascale parts used five-way, very long instruction word groups. If a shader program did not have five perfectly independent operations ready at once, some lanes sat idle. That made peak numbers look high, but real programs often left performance on the table due to underutilization. Later, AMD introduced Terascale 3 with four-way, very long instruction word groups instead of five. Reducing the width made it easier for compilers to keep the lanes busy, improving real throughput at the same clock speed. Terascale 3, used in many Radeon HD 6000 models, also strengthened fixed function geometry, adding a more capable tessellation unit to improve direct X11 workloads. Across the Terascale generations, AMD delivered full direct X11 feature support on the Radeon HD 5000 family and continued it on Radeon HD 6000. Terascale could run general compute via OpenCL, but the very long instruction word style and scheduling constraints made wide compute use harder than on later designs. Those limitations are a key reason AMD moved to Graphics Core Next afterward, which replaced very long instruction word with a more flexible scalar plus single instruction, multiple data approach. AMD RDNA1, RDNA2, RDNA3, and RDNA4. RDNA1. The first Radeon DNA architecture replaced Graphics Core Next with a gaming-focused design. It introduced the workgroup processor layout, streamlined caches, and a shorter graphics pipeline for better performance per watt compared with Vega-era designs. Cards like Radeon RX 5700 used this first generation. Background and lineage to later RDNA generations documented in AMD and third-party overviews. RDNA 2 Second Generation RDNA DNA added full DirectX 12 Ultimate feature support, including hardware-accelerated ray tracing, mesh shading, variable rate shading, and sampler feedback. It also debuted Infinity Cache, a large on-die cache that reduces external memory traffic and boosts effective bandwidth. RDNA 2 powered Radeon RX 6000 and the current game consoles from Microsoft and Sony. RDNA 3 third generation RDNA introduced a chiplet design on desktop cards with separate graphics compute and memory cache dies, plus updated compute units and second generation Infinity Cache. It launched in the Radeon RX 7000 family and later appeared in several handheld and console refresh products. RDNA 4 Fourth generation RDNA arrived as the Radeon RX 9000 series, adding improved ray tracing accelerators and expanded artificial intelligence acceleration, alongside new upscaling features branded Fidelity FX Super Resolution 4 on supported games and drivers. Public launches and driver notes place RX 9000 parts and FSR 4 in early 2025 and later driver updates. Intel. Before discrete ARC cards, Intel shipped many generations of integrated graphics in its laptop and desktop processors. These designs evolved from fixed function blocks into fully programmable unified shaders. The XELP step introduced with the Tiger Lake processors was a major rewrite focused on efficiency, more execution units per slice, larger caches, improved media engines, and modern features like variable rate shading. It kept power low for laptops while raising real gaming performance compared with earlier Intel integrated graphics. XELP is the foundation that later discrete designs build on.
Intel's first modern discrete gaming cards used the XEHPG architecture branded Arc Alchemist. Key additions were hardware ray tracing units per shader array for bounding volume traversal and ray triangle tests, matrix engines called XMX for artificial intelligence workloads such as super resolution in XE super sampling, full DirectX 12 ultimate feature support, including mesh shading and sampler feedback. Alchemist established Intel's driver model and toolchain for desktop gaming and for compute via one API. The second generation ARC chips, marketed as the B series, improved front end throughput caches and the ray tracing blocks and delivered faster mesh shading and broader game compatibility. Intel announced the B580 and B570 in December 2024, with retail availability starting mid December and January. Intel highlights higher performance per watt and better scheduling and compression versus Alchemist. Celestial is the third generation step on Intel's public graphics roadmap after Battle Mage. As of September 22, 2025, Intel has discussed Celestial as a future architecture, but has not provided retail launch details comparable to Alchemist or Battle Mage. Treat it as the next planned evolution of the same unified shader design, expected to advance ray tracing, machine learning acceleration, and scheduling. Status based on Intel's public overviews to developers. I made an awesome video about every CPU architecture, so don't forget to watch it later, okay?